Welcome. Uh, my name is Peter Glick. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to offer a presentation to you today about, uh, in my case, the issue of global water resources. And I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to participate. Uh, when we're done, uh, hopefully uh, there will be an opportunity for a little bit of back and forth, perhaps some Q&A, uh, but, but we'll see. Uh, let me begin by sharing my screen here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the world water crisis. Uh, many of my comments will be relevant for other resources as well, energy, forestry, agriculture, biodiversity. Uh, my focus and my experience is on water and the issue of climate change. Uh, water is connected to everything we care about, and I'll use it in a sense as a proxy to talk about global resources in general. We live on a water planet, but very little of the world's water resources are fresh. Uh, very few of the water resources on the planet are available and accessible to humans. Uh, that big blue dot is the total volume of, the wa of water on the planet. The smaller blue dot is the amount of fresh water on the planet. And it's a tiny fraction of the total water available and even a tiny fraction of those water resources are accessible to humans. What I'll be doing is describing the nature of the world's water problems, and I'll also describe a path forward to solve them. In terms of the global water crisis, there are many pieces to this, of course, but for me, the most serious, the worst, and in many ways, the most inexcusable problem is the failure to provide safe water and sanitation for billions of people. It's the 21st century and yet huge numbers of people on the planet still lack access to the most basic fresh water and most basic sanitation services. And these people live in what we describe as water poverty, the result of society's failure to spend the money required to apply technology that we well understand and to make the fundamental commitment to provide safe water and sanitation for all. Among the worst consequences of that failure is uh, water-related diseases. There are millions of cases of preventable water-related diseases every year, cholera, dysentery, parasitic diseases like schistosomiasis and guinea worm, uh, and millions of cases of preventable deaths, many of which are children under the age of five. But this isn't just a problem in developing countries. Even in the richer countries of the, of the world, we have populations without access to clean, safe, affordable water. Uh, this is Flint, Michigan, where thousands of people were exposed to lead and other contaminants after a failure of the water system and the failure of their local governments. And this isn't just a problem in cities. In California, hundreds of thousands of people lack access to safe water and sanitation, almost all in disadvantaged, primarily Latino communities in the Central Valley, exposed to agricultural chemicals, uh, high salinity, uh, and again, a failure of governments to provide safe and affordable water services that most of us take for granted. Another part of the world's water crisis is the massive contamination of our freshwater systems with industrial and human wastes. The start of the environmental movement in the United States was in part uh, to protect water resources. Here, uh, the Cuyahoga River catching fire in 1969, which captured the imagination of the American public. This is actually a photograph from a previous incident when the Cuyahoga River in Ohio caught fire in 1952. But these kinds of incidences led in many ways to the public movement for clean water in the United States. It led to the passage of the Clean Water Act uh, and the Safe Drinking Water Act in the 60s and 70s. But even those efforts to clean things up uh, failed to solve our water problems today. Even today, we have toxic algal blooms. We have new drinking water contaminants appearing in Lake Erie, for example, again, where the Cuyahoga River uh, ends. Uh, of just a few years ago, a problem with toxic algal blooms led to the closure of the water supply for the city of Toledo, Ohio. And we continue to have serious water quality problems around the world, 
uh, in different forms in different places and at different times. Without water, we don't have food. 80% of the water that humans use uh, goes to the agricultural sector. And a substantial portion of these water resources come from unsustainable groundwater overdraft. By some estimates, 30 to 40% of today's production of global food comes from water resources that come from unsustainable sources of groundwater overdraft. This cannot continue. And yet we have to grow more food for more people in the future or get better about what we grow and how we grow it and where we grow it and how the world's food system delivers what we grow to hungry mouths. In many ways, the food problem we face is itself a water problem. And many of our worst ecological problems are associated again with our use of fresh water. Freshwater ecosystems cover less than 1% of the Earth's surface, but they, can turn, they contain a third of known vertebrates, including 40% of fish, fish species around the world. The Freshwater Living Planet Index, a measure of the health of freshwater ecosystems representing nearly 3,400 species of birds, fish, amphibians, mammals, and reptiles, has declined by 83% since 1970, a collapse described by some as catastrophic. 80 different freshwater fish species have gone extinct, and disturbingly enough, 16 of them in just the last year. Another indication of the incredible importance of fresh water for ecosystem health and biodiversity, and yet the vulnerability of our ecosystems to the way humans take water out of those freshwater systems. Water is also a political issue. Half of the land area of the planet is in what we call an international river basin, a river shared by two or more countries. Growing water scarcity means growing tensions over water. And this graph comes from the water conflict chronology, an open source database that we maintain at the Pacific Institute showing recent trends in water conflicts around the world from 1980 up until 20, 2019. And it shows, first of all, a tremendous increase in the number of water conflicts that occur each year. But it also shows the kinds of conflicts that we're seeing. A conflict started where water is a trigger of conflict, the blue, the blue chart, uh, or where water targets uh, where water are targets or casualties of conflict in red, or where water systems have been a weapon of conflict in green. And in all of these cases, we see a dramatic increase in the number of conflicts over water resources in recent years. And of course, we know we're changing the climate. The science is strong. Every professional scientific organization on the planet, every National Academy of Sciences on the planet, acknowledges that humans are changing the climate. Other talks here will focus on the issue of climate change in much more detail, but let me note that among the worst impacts of human-caused climate change will be impacts on water resources, changes in water availability and quality, changes in rainfall events and evaporation rates as temperatures go up, changes in extreme events, including floods and droughts. And this isn't a future problem, this is already a problem for today. These impacts are being observed as already. Uh, and there's another piece to this as well. Water is very closely tied to energy. It takes water to produce the energy we use. It takes energy to produce and clean and distribute the water resources that we, that we use. And we must reduce the energy and greenhouse gas footprint of our water system while also preparing to deal with the now unavoidable consequences of climate change, those impacts we can no longer avoid. As a note in this area, natural catastrophes are on the rise. This is a graph uh, that shows the total number of natural catastrophes worldwide broken out by hydrologic events, those related to our water resources, meteorological events in green, uh, related to extreme weather events like floods and droughts and storms, climatological events, and then at the bottom, geophysical events. 
the vast majority of these natural catastrophes are in some ways related to both the climate and to our water resources. Uh, Swiss Re, which provides these data uh, and is one of the major reinsurance companies on the planet, notes, quote, the only plausible ex explanation for the rise in weather-related catastrophes is climate change, end of quote. But let me also talk in the context of dealing with the global crisis around water to the issue of solutions and what I call the soft path. I'd like to offer some thoughts about how we can solve our water-related problems. My work uh, has focused on defining what I call the soft path for water, a new way of thinking in an integrated way about tackling freshwater challenges. There are many components of this, but part of the key point here that there is that there is an alternative way forward. There is a way to solve our water crises and to move forward to a more sustainable future. And let me describe what I mean by the soft path for water. The hard path, which is the way we have dealt with water in the past century, is build for water supply, find more water supply, take more water out of our rivers, out of our ecosystems, out of our groundwater systems and build uh, hard infrastructure. The soft path says rethink water supply, find new sources of water, new sources of supply that don't require more damaging extraction of water from our natural ecosystems. The hard path said, satisfy projected demand, find new sources of supply to satisfy some assumption about ever increasing demand for water. But the soft path says rethink water demand. And I'll talk about this in a little more detail. The hard path says water is an economic good and only an economic good. But the soft path says water is an economic good and a human right. The hard path says build centralized water treatment systems and produce only one quality of water, potable water, when the soft path says protect water quality and match the quality of supply to the quality of the need. We don't need potable water, for example, to water our lawns. We don't need potable water quality to flush our toilets. And some might argue we don't even need lawns at all, but match water quality the quality of the water that we have with the quality of the water that we need. The hard path gives no thought to ecosystems, to ecosystem water needs or to ecosystem health. The soft path says protect ecosystem needs, protect ecosystem health. <clears throat> and the hard path is a path where we have centralized management and limited public participation. But the soft path calls for community participation about how we manage our water resources, flexible water institutions. Uh, these differences are critical for moving forward. And here's what they mean. They mean provide for the human right to water and think about water not just as an economic good, but as a human right. The UN declared a human right to water in 2010, and we're making progress on meeting water and sanitation goals under the sustainable development goals. But we, much, we must do much more to provide safe and affordable water for all. The failure to meet basic needs isn't a technology problem. It's not an economic problem. We know how and we have the money, but we have failed to mobilize the resources. We need to think differently about supply, not new demands, not aqueducts, not groundwater extraction, but wastewater treatment and reuse, stormwater capture and appropriate desalination. We have to rethink water demand. We need to be much more efficient in the way we use the water we're already extracting from the system. There's a massive opportunity to improve the efficiency of water use. Let's produce more of what we want with less water. And this is true for agriculture. Let's grow more food with less water, with improved irrig irrigation efficiency, uh, improved soil moisture monitoring, improved crop choices. We must acknowledge the value of ecosystems even when our traditional economic system has failed to do so. 
For water, one approach is the restoration of natural flowing rivers, including guaranteeing minimum flows and removing dams. This is the Elwha Dam on the Elwha River in the Pacific Northwest, uh, the largest dam removal project in the United States. And this is that river after that dam was removed in 2014 and 2015. And salmon fisheries on the Elwha River are now being restored. And we need better institutions. We have to change our institutions. Nelson Mandela said in the context of water, quote, it's one thing to find fault with an existing system. It's another thing altogether, a more difficult task to replace it with another approach that is better. That means managing our water resources and our energy resources and our biodiversity systems with different kinds of institutions, managing for sustainability, not for extraction, for equity, not for ex exclusion. Some final thoughts. The freshwater crisis is real and it's bad. There are human, economic, and economic environmental costs uh, to inaction. Not everything is getting worse and we need new thinking. We need solutions that are sustainable, scalable, and socially responsible. We need new technologies or better application of existing technologies. We need better economics or better application of economics. And we need smarter, more integrated institutions. And finally, new actions, commitments, partnerships, and communications and outreach can move us in the right direction. Thank you very much.